everybody. <gasps> Good to see y'all. So just so you know, if you want to check out Next Steps right now, you can head over there right now. Um, but if you're staying in service, then I think you're going to enjoy the message today because it is all about God's grace and what he's done for us. Amen? So um, this morning, I just have a couple of things that I wanted to do before we get started. I do want to welcome our online family. Everybody just say, hello, online family. Um, yes. So we are actually going to going to be launching our services as soon as we can on Facebook Live. So that's another outlet we'll get to to just reach people from. And I want to say hi to Pastor Barry. He is watching, so y'all can say hi if you want to. But he, yeah, say hi, Pastor Barry. He just sends his love, and some of you may know, some of you may not know, but he's getting his pilot's license. So y'all just pray for him, because that's not an easy thing to do. And I told First Service this, and I'll tell you this, that I'm actually going to wait till he gets several more hours of flying time <laughs> before I actually get in the plane with him. <laughs> so I feel like that's wisdom. No, God's mercy and grace and goodness and protection is on, on us because this is his will for us to, to navigate into aviation, which is a, an area of ministry that we've never really wanted to do, but the Lord just kept saying do it. So we're just being obedient, and y'all just pray for us in the midst of that. So we've got some pilots in the house, right? Where are my pilots? Or were they first service? They were first service. We have some brothers that are pilots. So if you're a pilot, you can talk pilot shop with Barry. But um, let's just jump into the word because this morning, I believe that Holy Spirit is going to minister a new revelation or your next level of understanding of the grace of Jesus Christ, the gospel of grace. Amen? How many of you would love to have another um, just dose of what Jesus did for you on the cross and what that means for you right now. I want more and more and more. I uh, was in this, oh, there's my picture. Okay, I'll explain that to you. See, I'm a squirrel type of a person. I can't. <laughs> um, by the way, uh, in Next Steps, we will be taking personality tests. I found out my personality. I already knew this intrinsically, but I'm an ENFP, which means I'm a campaigner, which means I'm a party person. You know, I mean, go figure. Like, that's a big surprise to anybody. But one of the weaknesses of that personality is the squirrel situation. So, like... Listen, if you're a fellow ENFP -er or somebody that easily gets distracted, I, I mean, it's real, right? It's the struggle is real. So um, it's the way Jesus made us somehow, some way, I believe that it is. But there's my happy Jesus. I love that picture of Jesus. And the scandal of grace. This is a very, very hot message right now because some people love it and some people are in fear of it. But we're going to do our best to understand what grace has done for us. So let's pray. Let's invite Holy Spirit to open our eyes. And I believe he's going to do that very thing today. Amen. So as I was, I was saying, I was in the bathroom and I, this bathroom over here, and I was just laughing and giddy and I realize that I'm drunk off the grace of God <laughs> it's the trampoline I'm bouncing on right now guys I mean I don't know how else to explain it but I saw something about grace this week that I cannot unsee I can't go back and I want to take you guys with me okay so let's pray Holy Spirit let's just as a sign of surrender to Holy Spirit's just movement in this house this morning. Let's just lift our hands. Holy Spirit, we honor you. We are so thankful for your ministry. You are the seal that has been set upon our heart that we are God's inheritance. We are the, the inheritance that the Father paid such a high price for and you are the seal that we belong to him so holy spirit we invite you we welcome you we long for you to do and say what you long to do and say in our hearts and in our midst we ask that you would just make grace so much more real in our life and we ask holy spirit that even while i'm speaking, that you would minister healing to people, that you would minister answers to people, that you would minister financial increase to people, that you would do what you know each person needs in their heart and life this morning. Only you can. So we just 
set you on a pedestal this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you receive that? Okay, let's talk about grace and why it's such a controversial message. I mean, has anybody heard late, recently, lately, that the grace message, you know, just beware of the grace message. And, and if you get too far into grace, it could lead you down a wrong path. But I want to encourage you this morning that I feel like we have been sold a bill of lies where grace is concerned because grace is the very thing that qualifies us for all that God has given us. Amen. So let's, let me read something to you. I didn't have a joke this morning. But I have a song. I have lyrics to read to you. And um, I felt like this was really an appropriate way to start the service. So, Scandal of Grace. Some of you know the song, but it's Grace, What Have You Done? Has anybody ever wondered, Grace, Can I cannot believe what it's telling me it's just done. You were murdered for me on that cross. Accused in absence of wrong, my sin washed away in your blood. Do you believe if you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior that your sins are absolutely washed away? Okay, well, I believe that we do believe that to a certain extent, but I want to take us deeper in that. So we're going to go off into that a little bit deeper. Too much to make sense of it all. I know that your love breaks my fall. The scandal of grace, you died in my place so that my soul will live. Aren't you thankful? He didn't have to, but he was the only one that could die in our place. He was the only sin offering that would forever erase and eradicate sin consciousness from our lives. Amen? And so the next part of this song is the chorus, and it says, Oh, to be like you, give all that I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you forever, the hope in my heart. I have news for you guys this morning. If you've received Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life, you now are living inside the Messiah. You are living in Christ. That means you have been recreated. You have a new nature. You no longer have a sin nature. It's gone. It's done. In fact, the blood of Jesus kicked it out of your life. I'm going to use Bobby as an example again today, but uh, I think it was last week or the week before, um, Bobby uh, got rid of his appendix. <laughs> so just like Bobby no longer has an appendix, it was cut and removed out of him, you no longer have a sin nature. Your nature is now the nature of Jesus Christ himself. And I'm going to prove that to you in scripture, okay? But we are now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We are holy and spotless and without blame in his sight. I want to introduce a thought to you this morning as we dive off into what grace has done for us. I want to introduce a thought to you that when, once you've received the love of Jesus, that the Father no longer sees you outside of Jesus. If we could just put our mind around that just for, just for a moment and realize that we have been told that as Christians, we don't have a choice but to sin. Because there's been some scripture that's made it appear as if that's what was being said. But the truth is, is that once you've received the blood of Jesus, the grace of Jesus, that now we have a choice. Whereas before we were slaves to our sin nature, but once we received the love of Jesus and our nature was recreated in Christ, that now we have the freedom to choose. And once you understand what Jesus did for you on the cross, once you realize that he took your punishment, he took your judgment, he took your sickness, your disease, your poverty, he took all of that to himself. I just want you to realize that if you will allow yourself to fall into the fact that grace has done everything for you and made you right in the eyes of, of the Father, that you will never be the same again. Amen? And there will be this newness of life that says, why would I ever want to sin once I know that? Now, if I sin, that's not who I am. It's not who I am. If I sin as a Christian, that does not change my nature. And if you don't understand that right now, 
if you were to make, or I shouldn't say make a mistake, but if you were to miss it, if you were to fall in some way to sin, the tendency that we have as believers is if we miss it, especially if we miss it real big and we know it, immediately, what do you do? You start beating yourself up. You start feeling guilty and shame. You start feeling like, I can't come back into the Father's presence. But the truth is, is that if you believe what Jesus did for you, changed your nature, that sin doesn't define you. And you can get right back up and say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, not because of what I've done, but because of everything he's done for me. That is my identity. That's what I'm standing on. It's as if, you know, did anybody ever deal with bullies in school? And it's as if the enemy was that bully in school and he was bullying you around and he was pushing you around and he was making you do stuff that you didn't want to do. And he was really, um, there was fear connected to that bully in school. It's as if Jesus came in with his blood, and it's like he's our, he's our big brother, right? It's like we have big brother Hulk Hogan Jesus on our side now from this point forward. And the next time that bully shows up, once he sees, <laughs> wait a second, once you understand what Jesus has done for you, it's, it's as if you could stick your tongue out to that bully and say, you can never get me again because my big brother Jesus has already taken care of this. I'm telling you guys, it seems reckless, it seems scandalous, but what Jesus did for us on, this cro on the cross is absolutely, in some ways, and I, won't, I don't like to use this word, but it feels almost incomprehensible, but I believe we're going to comprehend it, because Paul said we could. So let's look at some scripture, and let's just move forward. I get to be with you guys for two weeks, so I'm going to go a little bit slower, and I really, really, my heart. My heart is for each and every one of you to be set free from a sin consciousness. Amen? We need to be alive to a righteousness consciousness. I don't care if you missed it so bad last night. That's not who you are if you've received what Jesus has done for you. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And what you behold, you become. So if you are beholding every mistake that you've ever made, it's just a pattern you get stuck in. But if you make a mistake and you return immediately to the truth of who you are, I promise you, I guarantee you, that that will become the pattern of your life. I may have missed it, but that's not who I am. I may have missed it, but that's not who I am. Amen? I'm so thankful for this grace. So let's talk about it a little bit more. Throw my other picture of Jesus. I love this picture. Jesus was anointed with joy. Amen? I just love that about him. This is from the book of Matthew, or the Gospel of Matthew. It's a movie. It's an older movie, but he was my favorite Jesus. His name's Bruce Marciano, and I just love, he just looks so much like he could be Jesus, <laughs> and I love the smile. It makes you realize Jesus has a smile and a joy that's contagious. Oh, I'm so thankful for Jesus. I'm so thankful for grace. Whoops. These are my notes, and they're really thick. Okay, we're going to jump off into what does it truly mean to be saved by grace. How many of you would love to know more about what Jesus did for you? What it really means. Okay, because I believe he wants to show you. My mission for this message today, I have a mission. I've been sent to accomplish a mission, is to see as many people set free from the bondage of sin consciousness, which is the constant awareness of your sin, and it's no good. It's no good, and it's unhealthy, and it's not good to maintain. But I want to see people set free from the bondage of sin consciousness and released into the freedom and liberty of grace. Amen? It is for freedom that Christ set you free. Either take it and believe it, or you stay stuck in a mentality that you're not good enough, that you keep missing it. Well, I have news for you. We would never be good enough. We were never going to be good enough to receive grace. But Jesus stepped in and he took our place. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Okay, so let's open up some Bible and just lay a foundation really quick. I would love for you to turn to Ephesians. If you guys will turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 10, I'm going to read... Um, Ephesians 1, 2 through 8 first, just to set the scene a little bit. And, um, you know, 
I was listening to, to Pastor Dan Moeller. Um, I've been listening to a lot of messages on sin consciousness. Once I, once I realized that I've been dealing with it, I mean, how many of you deal with a constant feeling of being a failure? I mean, don't raise your hands. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I'm going to put some examples out there. You feel like a failure all the time, or you feel like you just don't measure up, or if you make a mistake, you don't feel like you can recover from it. I've dealt with that feeling, that uh, bondage for a lot of my life. And I didn't realize it's because I wasn't truly believing what grace had done for me. But I am a new woman today. I just want to tell you something. I saw something last or this past week about grace that I cannot unsee. And when I saw this, inside I said, I've got to reread my Bible. Because if you do not understand grace, I can assure you, you will not rightly divide the word of God. That's a big statement. And I wouldn't say it if I didn't feel confident in what I'm telling you, but if you do not understand grace, you will never rightly divide the word of God. And it's a huge concept to think that grace, the filter of grace, can make or break how you see yourself, but it can. And I want each and every one of you to see yourself in Christ. So we're going to read in Ephesians 1, 2, 3, 8. I'm going to read that to you. Uh, don't worry about turning to it. May grace, everybody just receive it right now because this is Paul declaring. He's saying, may grace, which is God's unmerited favor and spiritual peace, be yours from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus, the Father, is giving you grace and peace. May blessing be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, who has blessed us in Christ. Everybody say, in Christ. In Christ. That's where you are. Pastor Barry says this, and it's so true. If you don't know where you are, you're not going to know who you are. If you do not know that you are in Christ, you will never know who you are. You will never know your true identity. So let's just keep moving forward. In Christ, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm, even as he chose us, and I like what the Amplified says, actually picked us out for himself and as his own. So he picks Sky out for himself and his own. I'm just using somebody here. Before, in Christ, there it is again, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be what? Holy. That we should be holy. How many of us have had a hard time swallowing that pill, that I'm holy because of what Jesus did? And blameless in his sight. Do you realize that when you receive Jesus, you have now become holy and blameless in his sight now and forevermore. Your sins, past, present, and future, have all been covered by the blood of Jesus. Some of us, that's a hard concept. It's a hard thing to, to imagine that, you know, if I sin tonight or if I sin tomorrow or next week or six months from now, that's already been forgiven. Do you realize this? You, if you sin two weeks from now, you have already received forgiveness. Because if you think about it, all of our sins were future from the cross, right? So why do we get so caught up in this feeling of, well, once I receive Jesus and if I sin, that I somehow have to earn my way back into righteousness? False, false doctrine, false, false, false. You could never earn his grace. You could never earn his mercy. You will never be able to before the cross or after the cross. It's a sin consciousness. It's a law consciousness. And we're going to just see that. I'm going to keep moving forward. That we are blameless in his sight, even above reproach before him in love. For he foreordained us, amen, to be adopted as his own children through Jesus Christ. Thank you. In accordance with the purpose of his will, because it pleased him and it was his kind intent, so that we might be to the praise and the commendation of his glorious grace, which he so freely bestowed on us in the beloved. That word beloved is capitalized. It's talking about Jesus. We have been blessed in Jesus. In him, we have redemption. Just say, in him I am redeemed. In him I am redeemed, which is deliverance and salvation through his blood, the remission 
forgiveness of our offenses, shortcomings, and trespasses in accordance with the riches and the generosity of his gracious favor. I have news for you guys today. Our God, our Father is rich in mercy. He's rich in it. In fact, he loves to give mercy. He's, he has so much mercy to give. He is overflowing with it. That is the father that we belong to. And he's the very one that gave Jesus to take our punishment. Um, if you wouldn't mind, I, while we're talking about this, put the flagrum the, um, up there on the screen. Okay, we're going to move quickly. I'm just laying a foundation this week. We'll talk more about some controversial things next week, and I feel like it's going to set some people free. So, um, which he lavished upon us in every kind of wisdom and understanding. So, let's look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, which you might already be at. It says, for by what? By grace. What have you been saved by? Grace. Through faith. Faith that grace is real. Faith that the blood of Jesus has cleansed me from all unrighteousness. Amen? Okay. So you have been saved for by grace you have been saved through faith and this not from yourselves. Oh, thank God. Because we could never measure up. We could never measure up. A weight is lifted. This is a gift. You can never earn it. You could never maintain it or sustain it with your own goodness and your own works, never gonna happen. <clears throat> and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. And it is not based on deeds, hallelujah, so that no one may boast, for we are God's workmanship, created in Messiah, hallelujah, for good deeds. See, we can never do good deeds apart from being in Christ. We can never do good deeds apart from the grace which we have received. If you try to do good deeds outside of grace to earn your salvation, it will not work. It's bondage. You're not, we'll never measure up. I'm not good enough. We're not good enough. And that's okay, right? That's okay. It takes humility to receive grace. Amen? Created in my Messiah for good deeds which God prepared for beforehand so that we might walk in them. Romans 4, 7 through 8. We're about to talk about something that um, really just blesses me when I think about it. See, King David, how many of you know who King David is? He wrote a lot of the Psalms. He was the king of Israel, the second king of Israel. And um, he had a lot of revelation, but he was also a prophet. And he prophesied some things. And Romans, Paul repeats what he said in Romans 4, 7 through 8. It says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Hallelujah. Blessed is the man whose sin, Adonai, will never count against him. That's us. He's looking forward into the future and he's saying, Blessed is that person whose sins God will never count against him. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says something similar. It says, He made the one, capital O, who knew no sin to become a sin offering on our behalf so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In him, we are spotless and without blame. Hallelujah. Psalm 32, which is where Dave, King David prophesied this, said, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. I'm so thankful. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit is no deceit. So I want to just tell you what Jesus did for us in the last few minutes that we have this morning. Because if you don't truly believe that Jesus took our punishment and our judgment, he took it all upon himself, you will still try to pay for your mistakes. And that is a sin consciousness. And that is where the enemy wants you to stay, always aware of how you don't measure up and how you're not good enough and how you don't deserve what God did for you. And truly enough, in and of ourselves, we don't. But in Christ, we're new creations. So let me tell you something. Sin consciousness is the enemy of a grace consciousness. And I want to fall headfirst into grace. Amen? 
Let's just fall into grace. Let's just realize we never could do it and we never will be able to do it, but it's okay because his grace took care of it. So this we're looking at, this is a flagrum, which is the uh, Roman term for a scourge or a whip. And we're going to talk about the punishment that Jesus took. And as, as we do this, I just want to set the stage um, in John 12, 30 through 33, um, because I want you to see something as we talk about what Jesus did. In John 12, 30 through 33, Yeshua responded, this voice hasn't come for my sake, but for yours. He's talking to the crowd. Now is the judgment of this world. Now is the judgment of this world. He's setting the stage. He's saying, guess what? Judgment of this world is about to come. But guess who it's coming to? Guess who the judgment of this world is coming to? Now the prince of this world will be driven up. And as I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was about to die. Listen to me. In a lot of your Bibles, it'll say, I will draw all men in, italic in italics unto myself. That was added... It was not in the original Greek. The subject that we're talking about right here is judgment. Jesus is saying, when I am lifted up, when I'm on that cross, I will draw all judgment to myself. Everything that we have ever done wrong as humanity, Jesus absorbed it. He took it. That is overwhelming when you think about it. But let's, let's talk about what Jesus endured. You know, the passion started in the Garden of Gethsemane. If some of you don't know the story, I'll just share it a little bit with you. But the passion was the suffering of Jesus. That's when the punishment for sin, the sin of the world, began to take place. And Jesus was in the garden. And the word says that he sweat drops of blood. Do you all remember that? It talks about how he sweat drops of blood. That... There's a medical term for that. It's a very rare thing, but it's called hematidrosis. And I want to make sure that I'm saying it right. Hematidrosis. And if I don't say it exactly right, just forgive me and I'll correct it. It's somewhere in my notes, but I don't want to go looking for it right now. Um, and I, I do want to say something about this, because this is so important why you understand the word men was not written there. And, and this is why it's important for you to understand that the subject was judgment. Because if religion causes you to be okay with the misinterpretation of this verse, it will cause you to miss the truth and power of the scripture. If you are okay with the thought of, I'll draw all men unto me, you miss entirely what Jesus was saying right there. He's not saying, yeah, by way of them understanding what I just did, I'll draw men to me. But he was referring to, I'm going to take every bit of judgment to myself. Religion will keep you stuck in a place of, of underestimating what Jesus did for you, okay? So it's important that you understand that all of our judgment was imputed on Jesus himself. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's getting ready to drink of the cup, and there, the anxiety and the level of just agony about the, the passion that he's about to suffer is so great that it says it almost took his, his life. It was so severe that it actually almost killed him, the intensity. I don't know if anybody's ever been under that much pressure or strain that you almost died, but this is where Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, so much so that he began to sweat drops of blood, which is, a med which is actually, it is possible, it's very rare that somebody would be under that kind of extreme pressure, but it's where the blood vessels and the corpuscles under the skin burst, and it's as if you're sweating drops of blood. Now, going through something like that, a mental strain and agony, you can only imagine that it would weaken you physically. If you can relate to being under such a hard thing in your life, it can actually weaken you physically. So this is what happens right before Jesus is arrested. And you'll see from there that once he bows his knee, so to speak, he yields and says, your will be done, Father, and he drinks of the cup, that the, the soldiers come and they take him. And so they begin to, you know, go through the process of a trial, and they're charging Jesus with blasphemy and, and all these things. And, and Pilate doesn't want anything to do with it, right? 
he, he realizes that this, there's something different here, but he eventually gets, gives in. But first he sends Jesus to be flogged. He sends Jesus to be scourged. And he's hoping, his hope is that once he does this and he brings them back, he brings them back in front of the people, that they'll, they'll, have, they'll feel sorry for him. They'll see how much he suffered and they'll, they'll go with releasing Barabbas. I mean, go with releasing Jesus versus Barabbas, but that didn't happen. But he was sent to be flogged. So in that day and time, the amount of flogging that a human being could sustain was around 40 lashes. If you were going to be crucified, they would stop it somewhere around 39. If you weren't and they were just going to kill you, I mean, there were people that were just scourged to death. Jesus was beaten with a flagrum, a whip, 39 times. Now this is not just a small flesh wound. We need to understand that this was woven with bones of sheep and goats and metal pieces. And in fact, you would, the person that was receiving it would be tied to a, a post and the, the officer would, would, you know, whip, send forth the whip and it would grab hold of the flesh as it would come back. So as it's going, it's grabbing, it's sinking into the flesh and then it's being ripped off as it's pulled back. I mean, if you've seen The Passion of the Christ, you kind of have an idea of what this looks like. I genuinely believe that Jesus spilled every drop of blood in his body when we see what he went through, but he was whipped 39 times, so much so that every trace of his body probably had ripped open wounds. And if you've ever had a wound to your rib cage, I don't know if anybody has, I haven't, but if you've had pneumonia or if you've had some kind of injury like a broken rib, you know that hurts to breathe, right? And you can't take a deep breath without a sharp pain. And if you understand exactly the physical thing that Jesus went through that we should have gone through, see, he took our full punishment, that it would have been really difficult for Jesus to take a deep breath from that point forward. It would have, He would have been in tremendous pain from the rest of the the passion and he would have had a hard time breathing he probably would have gone through spells of vomiting i've been reading a book on the forensic study of the crucifixion and it's helped me to realize just exactly what jesus went through but his body would be reacting in ways that we don't understand and so he went through the lashes and then they take him from there and what do they do they fashion a crown of thorns throw that picture up Jackie I don't know if I have two pictures I, I guess that's my only picture I tried to find the picture that looked the most like what that's it right there thank you you see we kind of think that it was just a circular like garland of thorns but the truth is um, when you study what a crown of thorns was it was more like a cap and so not only was it going around this part of his head, but it was actually going around or on the top of his head. And if you just take your hand and you touch your scalp, there's no real place on your scalp that it doesn't hurt. So imagine this is not just placed on his head gently, it's shoved down on his head. And if you believe at all that the Shroud of Turin is authentic, it is what it is, I do. I, I mean, it's, this is not Bible, but I do believe that the Shroud of Turin is, an authentic, is authentic. It talks about the level of blood, the amount of blood that was released from the head. And, and so they took the reed and they would beat him on the head while he had the, the cap of thorns. Now, guys, this is our punishment. Keep in mind, the whole time Jesus is going through this, this is what we deserved. Not what he deserved. He drew all of our punishment. This is what grace has done. And so from there, he's taken and he's ridiculed and he's, he's mocked. And I totally forgot that they ripped his beard out of his face. Does anybody remember that? Go back to my nice picture of Jesus, the one where he's laughing. Um, can you imagine? I mean, who all has a beard? I mean, just tug on that just a little bit. It would have ripped pieces of flesh. But they mocked him. They slapped him. They ripped his beard out. This, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And he didn't say anything so that we could say something. Okay, he was silent. Isaiah 53, it, you know, read it sometime and recognize that all of our punishment, our sickness, our disease, everything was imputed to Jesus on the cross. To this man who, who has joy and love, 
And so I'm so thankful that I, we have these images of what I believe Jesus was like on this earth. I don't think he was solemn at all. <laughs> I think he was, I think he was, you know, slapping people on the back. I think it's this movie too that you see like he, Peter runs up to him and like gets up on Jesus' back, and like, you know, like a piggyback ride. <laughs> I would love to do that. Hey, Jesus. I want a piggyback ride. Um, and you guys, anybody that would want one, prob I'm sure can in heaven say, he's a real person and he loves us. He took our punishment. He took our shame. He took everything that we could ever experience for a punishment and judgment. He took it. And what did he give us in return? He gave us righteousness. He gave us grace. Hallelujah. It says... Um, it says this, and I just want to, I know we're getting close, and I just want to, to uh, read this in Hebrews uh, really quick before we, we end. Um, Hebrews 2.14. I'm going to read it in the Amplified um, so that we can begin to realize that if, if God hadn't taken on flesh and blood to become like us, he couldn't have died. You can't kill God. God can't die. I mean, has anybody ever thought about that? You can't kill God. But he took on flesh and blood. Why? So that he could be, he could present his body as a sin offering. And it's the only offering that would release us from feeling like sinners, even when we've been saved. Okay, Hebrews 2.14, and we'll get ready to close. Since therefore these children share in flesh and blood, talking about us, in the physical nature of human beings, he himself in a similar manner partook of the same nature, that by going through the death, that by going through death he might bring to naught and make of no effect him who had the power of death, that is the devil. What did we see in John 12 when it talks about now the judgment of this world, now the prince of this world will be driven out? Right there, Jesus is saying, guess what? I'm getting ready to kick the devil's butt. I'm getting ready to break the power of sin and death because I'm about to draw all of the judgment that the enemy wanted to put on you. I'm about to take it. And he can't do anything about it. <laughs> he can't do one thing about it. Guys, get ready. Judgment's coming my way. And I'm the only being, the only human being that is worthy enough to be the sacrifice for the sin of all humanity. Whoa. So cool. Mm. So he did this that he might bring to naught and make of no effect him who had the power of death, that bully, that is the devil, and also that he might deliver. Say, I'm delivered. I'm delivered. I, am set free. I am set free. All those who through the haunting fear of death were held in bondage throughout the whole course of their lives. Jesus just set you free from a sin consciousness. Jesus just did what only he could do as a spotless lamb of God and took every trace of sin and punishment to himself. But thank you, Father, that he is a resurrected king, that he didn't stay in that grave. But see, if Jesus hadn't gone to hell and paid our price and did what only he could do, then if he'd have left anything on the table, any punishment on the table, we would have had to have taken it. But he didn't leave any punishment on the table. He took it all. Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful? Oh, let's just lift our hands right now and just thank God for grace. Thank you for grace. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for showing us new levels of grace, showing us how beautiful grace is. I believe with all my heart, I, I believe this, that the Lord would rather us err on the side of grace than err on the side of law because the law cannot do anything for us it was fulfilled it was a mirror to make people aware that they needed a savior it could not save people it just made them aware hey there is someone coming that can save you so this is a temporary thing for you to realize how much you need a savior and oh that savior was perfect and so I just I just tell you, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for doing what only you could do for setting us free, setting us free. So I want to encourage you next week that if you have questions of, I'm a Christian, now what about sin? <laughs> We're going to talk about that next week. 
Because there's some scripture out there that has been misinterpreted and misused to make us feel as Christians that we don't have a choice but to sin. But the truth is, is we do have a choice. And grace is what empowers us to make the choice to not sin. It's freed us from the bondage of sin.